Welcome to Living Mosaic. My name is Martha Holden. I'm a member of the Spark of Humanity Network. The Spark of Humanity Network is the parent of the Living Mosaic program. The Living Mosaic is obviously a video thing, among other things, designed or hoped to encourage a conversation about the concept that there is a solution to the pain, distress, horror, heartbreak that we experience in these times. There's stuff we can't change. We have, most of us of the Spark of Humanity Network believe there's something foundational under, under evolutionary happening, a, a development, a surge, if you will, of, in consciousness that we can't do anything about, nor do we want to do anything about. But because it's underneath, things are shaking around and are not familiar, there's a lot of human response that is, to put it mildly counterproductive, causing pain and distress, horror, tragedy, and that we can do something about. That's, that's the premise, that's the theory, that the solution to what needs a solution, which is the human response, can be envisioned as a living mosaic, a living, evolving mosaic. Many you know, shells, bits of glass, pieces of pebbles, pieces of mirror, whatever, to make up this vast and evolving mosaic of which we are each a unique and essential bit. Each with our, one of my friends doesn't like me to say niche, another friend says niche, which sounds much better, place, our little, a little cubby, a little place within the mosaic. And because the mosaic is evolving, so we need to be willing to evolve, and so our little place in the mosaic is alive and evolving so there's no there's no call for self-satisfaction and for complacency for just saying oh good i found it i'm in my niche i'm in my niche i'm in my place i'm in my cubby whatever we want to call it um you know we need to be staying alert and supporting each other and staying alert and alive and continuing with this living evolving process that keeps us as part, as integral, necessary, unique, each one of us, parts of the mosaic, and so that we are indeed part of the solution. Because doing this work, well, not just because, but anyway, side benefit, doing this work, engaging in this process, allows us to free from denial, or despair because we are doing something maybe invisible maybe we only recognize it within ourselves but we are doing something within that's within our power within each one of our power to be <coughs> be part of the solution and that's the basic premise of this series of programs the our the ability to find where we belong in the mosaic and to become who we are needed to be within the mosaic, that essential, what's essential of us, for us in the mosaic. We often refer to the practice from the Spark of Humanity, no surprise, since the Spark of Humanity sponsors <laughs> this program. And the Spark of Humanity is a spiritual practice or it's the basis of a spiritual practice where you, through your spark of humanity, or tone, or germ, or node, whatever, and if you don't like, if you don't like the word humanity, you can say true. There's something within you that is true, that is unextinguishable, that cannot be corrupted, and that cannot be polluted. We call it the spark of humanity. You call it whatever you need to. When you get in touch with that place within yourself, 
call it your spark. And through that, you reach out to connect with and affirm, or affirm and connect with, the spark in somebody else, anybody else. That strengthens their spark. It also strengthens your spark. And it seems that the strengthened spark acts to erode our defenses, which is one of the ways we keep ourselves from being aware of our spark, to clarify the bafflement, which is what do I do here, what's life about, <clears throat> and to release the distortions, which are what we develop in response to our bafflement. I think of it as we emerge into this reality from the safety of our mother's wombs. And what do I do now? How do I survive? What, you know, what's this all about? So there's bafflement. And because of the bafflement, we try different things to see what works. And that inevitably distorts us because we're being born into a distorted society. And because being distorted hurts, then we develop our defenses. That's sort of it's, look at the website, the Spark of Humanity website. So that, that exercise of claiming your spark, for which we need somebody else, we can't do it on our own, to locate your spark, and it may not be here. It may, who knows where, I don't know. I, some days I feel, feel I don't know where mine is. So you can find your own. It's there. Trust me, it's there. And it may take a while because you may be defended against it. Because the spark has a fearsome integrity. And integrity can be very scary for us who've been living in distortion and defense. But it's safe. It's safe to our essential spark, that place of true, true, uncorruptible is within us. It's safe for that. It's not safe for the defense mechanisms and the distortions and all our coping devices. Anyway, so when, so we, as we do that practice, and even if we don't, we're just offering that practice, we become more true to our sparks, true to our real selves, true to our essence. So it's like the mosaic is sort of inhaling us into where it needs us to be in order to be our part of the solution, which is, is living and evolving. So that's the, the cozy intro. This time, this week, we are talking about shame. Ouch, you say, well, I hope you looked at some of the earlier ones because shame is a, we don't want to start with shame, but this is where we are, shame. Now, I was in my, 50s, well into my 50s, before I really bumped in to the word, let alone the concept, of shame in a way that I could not avoid. It was part of the prologue for a group that I was a member of. And it talked about toxic shame and shame spirals. There was a lot of talk about shame back 20, 30 years ago. And I did not relate at all. When I looked back on it, I thought, I think that may be because when I was a young kid, my mother told me that I should feel ashamed or I should be ashamed. And because of my relationship with my mother, I wasn't going to do that. So I covered it over with a layer of plexiglass or Teflon or something, ice, whatever. And just shame was not, was not in my world at that point. They talk about shameless. We become shameless because we find that we don't know how to cope. We are incapable of having those around us nurture us and take care of us in the way that we need. And 
so we feel we should be able to do that. You know, if you've ever looked at a baby, an infant, a young child, yeah, they feel they should be able to get it the way they want it, what they feel they need. And so we, there, that shame starts there, and then we may cover it up. And the covering up may create more shame, which we cover up. And I can really only talk about my own experience with my shame, and which is, you know, you don't want to hear about that. But I'll try. <laughs> I'll do what I can to talk about general shame. I think that that shame is. It's something that we do tend to cover up or deny because we don't know what to do with it. Now that I'm older and feeling a little safer in the world, I see that my shame often comes because I didn't respond the way I'd like to, and I don't know how to deal with the situation. I don't have words. Is one of my classic roots to shame is there's something going on. It's dissonant. It grates against me. I grate against it. And I don't have the words. I don't, I can't access the resources to guide me how to respond to it, how to deal with the situation. So I am. You know, I might as I I don't belong here. I don't know how to do life. So I withdraw. I will do that with in friendships. I've done it for decades, less now, but you know, I did something that, I, if I were willing to admit it, that I'm sorry for. But I don't know how to talk about it, how to address it. So I decide, well, there are another, what, 8 billion people in the world. I don't need that friend. So it looks like I don't like the person. It's not that I don't like the person. It's that I can't find any way out of this dark cavern that I'm in. The door handles are knocked off. My wrists have been Cut, my hands have been cut off at the wrist. I don't have any, I can't push the buttons. I don't know how to get out of this. And so I bury it deeper. And so I act more from that, I'm not good enough, I'm not good. I don't, you know, belong, I'm no good at this place. So I shrink more and more, cower more and more and more more ashamed, more covering up the shame, and <clears throat> it's not helpful. Now, maybe I, I need to talk about it. Some of my friends say, okay, guilt and shame. Guilt is when you do something wrong. Shame is when you feel you are something wrong. I... I that's good enough to start with for me, or maybe to end with it. You know, not talking about guilt when I know I've done something wrong. I stole the neighbor's whisk broom when I was eight years old because it was so cute. It had a white plastic handle and had beautiful blue bristles, and it was so pretty. I just couldn't help but take it. Of course, people said, Martha, did you take that whisk broom? Oh, no. You know, I think there was shame in that denial, or maybe just wanting to avoid the consequences. Anyway, so, so the shame mounts up. I'm not sure, but it occurs to me that those who have suffered early childhood trauma, abuse of varying sorts, those who forget it until they feel safe enough to remember it, whether that's sort of far end of the shame spectrum is that I don't know how to deal with the situation. I don't know how to survive here. So I'm so ashamed because I feel I should know how to do this. You know, I'm a living organism. I'm supposed to have a, you know, move towards life, like plants grow towards the light. I'm supposed to, but I don't know how to do that here in this situation. So the, 
So to just cover it up, to bury it deep, as I said about the more minor shame, it, that's just occurred to me in the last couple of weeks as I've been talking, thinking about talking about this. So you can think about that. Um, what I've come to realize to sort of flip around, let's, let's get to the positive, let's get to the constructive, that first to, to become aware of the shame. That's big for me, just coming, becoming able to become aware that there's a feeling of shame, to thaw out that much, to scrape away the, the Teflon, the, you know, the microplastics or whatever is covering up the shame, the defenses that's covering up the shame, to become aware of it and then accept it that that's what it is, and then to do something about it. So we're no longer a victim of our own incapacity or our own sense of incapacity, so that we have a proactive, we have agency. So we have a, something proactive we can do about it. We can, of course, if we have the courage, which, you know, I generally have it in my life, we can actually get in touch with the person and talk to them about it. If we're really gutsy, we can talk to them in person about it. Or we can call them up or, you know, I don't know, I suppose you could send them a text, but it's a little, you know, anyway, if that's the best you can do. But the, the thing that I suspect, so I'm just offering it to you, as a way of dealing with the shame to get out from under it, because as we continue to accumulate this geology of shame, you know, we become less and less alive. We are more deadened to the world around us. We cannot respond freely to life. And life might be considered the creator, the mistress of this living mosaic we're talking about. So. <clears throat> you know, the more shame that we accrete, uh, it's not not constructive in this paradigm that we're creating here. Um, so I think what what we can offer, what I can offer, what the Spark of Humanity Network can offer is is just the idea of claiming our sparks vis-a-vis -vis the person who we sh feel shame in relationship with, or the people, one at a time, or perhaps the institution. Um, so to, once again, with the spark, to, to get in touch with our own spark and spend some time with it. It's good, I find it's always helpful, to <clears throat> let my awareness rest on my spark and let my spark rest within my awareness until they're Refamiliarize themselves because they've, you know, since way before this came into being, they knew each other. They're old, they're puppies that curl up together like a yin and a yang. So just, you know, take a few moments to get into that space. And then through the spark, be led to, not through the head, through the spark, allow yourself to be led to the spark and the other person or persons and even institutions have sparks. Maybe not of humanity, but of something. They have a, as one of my friends who uses highfalutin theological language, they have a divine vocation. They have an angel. So, when they turn their back on their divine vocation, they become demonic. But each institution has a divine vocation. So if it's an institution, corporation, country, whatever, um, but let's take keep it with the individuals at the moment. Through your spark, you reach out to connect with and affirm, or affirm and connect with, the spark, and let's keep it to one person. And you just let your spark and their spark affirm and connect. 
and just rest with that and see how it feels and see whether, just notice, maybe afterwards, if it's too intense while you're in this process of communion, um, see whether your defenses are a little eroded and whether your bafflement seems a little clarified. You're a little, you have a better idea about how to proceed or what's going on here. And maybe some of the coping mechanisms, which is the big word for distortions, <laughs> yeah, whether those are beginning to feel, oh, yeah, maybe I don't need that with this person. Yeah, it's such a, it can be such a relief. And you can do it in the secrecy of your own home. They don't ever need to know consciously. But that shifts things. It changes the whole dynamic. I have a dear friend who I, I think still is very fond of me, and she avoids me. She won't even meet my eye. And it finally occurred to me today when I was thinking about being with you today and talking with you that, oh, maybe that's shame on her part if she doesn't know how to make it better. And I have to say that it's been a challenging friendship. But it's that, that feeling gets in the way of anything alive and growing and healing happen. So try that out. You might start by just giving yourself some quiet time to be aware of shame. Don't start with the big stuff, is my suggestion. You know, let it, if you're open, if you're willing, we did a series of a chat on willing a few months ago. If you're willing and willing to stay off the screens and, sorry, but to just be quiet and by yourself, maybe outdoors, if you're willing, the, your awareness will catch on to the shame that is left, is, needs is ripe for resolution, I guess is the way to put it. And so when you do that, you can think about that and maybe let yourself feel it because you're safe. You're just, it's just you and you, you know, um, and feel, feel the shame of what it's about and look at its texture from a new angle because this is, today you're looking at it and this may have been a week ago or a month ago or 20 years ago or 60 years ago. Um, uh, and just sort of rest with it and see how it feels and how you are with it and then become aware of, okay, who, where can I affirm a spark here? Where can I connect with an affirm a spark? Which is how we claim our own sparks. We cannot claim our spark in isolation. We, I, I've, my spark is strengthened and becomes healthier and I become healthier, and I become more available to the inhaling of the mosaic, the stronger my spark is. And I can't do this on my own. I have to, I have to be connecting with and affirming the spark in someone else in order to have my spark strengthened so that my defenses are eroded, so my distortions are released, so my bafflement is clarified, so that I can be drawn into my place in the spark and releasing my shame, being aware of it, accepting it, and adapting to it is the way we can do that. Thank you for being with us. I'd like to remind you we are on Facebook. You're welcome to follow us on Facebook, whatever that means. And thank you to Orca Media here in Montpelier, Vermont, and to you and to Rose and Danielle and Sam and all those other people that are helping this happen so that hopefully you can enjoy it and join us as we are being drawn, aspiring to be drawn into our places within the mosaic so that we become truly part of the solution. 
because we either are or we're not. And the solution being in the solution is better. Thank you.